Great. Hello, everyone. I hope uh, you all are keeping the best of health. My name is Rohan, and I, along with my colleague Isha, would be the moderators for today's exciting event. I would firstly like to thank uh, you for removing your precious time from your busy schedule to attend the first ever Power R session hosted by Harbinger. So Power R is a series of interactive roundtable discussion amongst industry stalwarts where they would be discussing and sharing their experiences and insights about a particular topic. And the topic for today's discussion would be how to drive engagement in remote learning. Before we begin, uh, a few housekeeping tips. In case you cannot hear the audio, ensure you have selected the right speaker for audio output. You may test the same to see if it is working fine from the audio settings option on the lower left corner of your screen. And if necessary, please dial in using a phone. All attendees will be on mute by default. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a query or post it in the chat window. Any questions can be posed to the Q&A panel and uh, me and my colleague will be, we'll be more than happy to bring them up for the panelists to answer. And a recording shall be made available to all attendees within a few days. Great. So before we get into the crux, uh, it'll be great to know more about our audience today. So we have a few questions coming up for you. I'm, I'm just going to launch a poll and it should be up any minute. So there you go. Just to kind of get to know you better, it'll be great if you could put in your responses. So what is your current job role? How long is a particular class that you teach? And generally, how many learners do you have per class? And which of the following best describes your learners? So please go ahead, get in your answers. We'll, we'll give it 30 to 40 seconds. We've started to get responses. Thank you so much for your participation here. All right, we'll give it another 20 seconds. We're at around 45%. Wonderful. That's that's great. Thank you all for your participation. I will quickly end the poll. And we look at the results. So great. So we have many trainers around today. And talking about how long is the class that you teach, it's more than an hour, which is great. And how many learners do you have in your class? So oh, there's, there's a tie between 10 to 20 and 20 to 50. So that's wonderful. And which of the following best describes your learners? So majority of them are visual learners. And what digital tools do you use? So others is the maximum answers that we've got. And we'll be happy to know which tools you use if you can put it in the chat. But thank you all so much for your active participation on this. It really helps to know our audience better. So now it's time for some introduction. Our host for today's roundtable is Dr. Vikas Joshi. Dr. Vikas Joshi is a business leader who is passionate about product development and technology entrepreneurship. 
His mission is to help create software products that make a difference and a key part of this mission is to inspire tech professionals and entrepreneurs to grow and develop. We welcome you, Vikas, and the stage is all yours. Thank you, Rohan. Um, excited to be here with all our distinguished panelists whom uh, we will introduce in a moment. Um, but just uh, wanted to get started with um, sharing with you what we are gonna accomplish today. Uh, and it's real simple. Number one, why is learner engagement such a big deal? Um, number two, what are the stages of engagement that one should be aware of? Um, what are the different engagement strategies that you could use and how to select one? What are the factors that drive the selection? And finally, once you have decided to use an engagement strategy, what digital tools will help you in engaging remote learners? Those are the four pieces we're gonna do. It's super simple. And this, this whole discussion will just flow in those four steps, one after the other. I come at it this from a background of running a company that specializes in e-learning and enterprise software. And that's Harbinger. So at Harbinger, we, we have been operating in this field for last 30 years. And as a CEO of a company with over 700 people, I'm also a consumer of learning technology. So uh, we do a lot of leadership development. We do a lot of technical skill development, soft skill development, and we are users of all these digital tools as well, in addition to being the vendors of these products. Um, the other perspective I have on this is my doctoral study, which was in uh, workplace learning. And so this is a topic which is very close to my heart. Uh, my workplace learning was focused on the learning processes that entrepreneurs encounter in the, uh, in the startups that they are part of. And uh, that, that was a fascinating study. So anyway, uh, with that, we'll get on with our panel. And uh, I'm very happy to welcome all of our panelists. And I'm going to ask each one of them to introduce themselves a little bit and also tell us uh, why they are interested in this topic. What, what perspective do they want to bring to it? Starting with you, Ian Nikas, please. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Ian Nikas, uh, originally from the UK, but I've been working in the US for the last uh, 12 years. I'm a, probably a, not so much on the learning side, but an uh, assessment industry expert, been involved for uh, over 18 years working for testing companies, uh, testing elements of Pearson and more recently at PSI Services as the CIO for the last uh, 12 years, running all software development infrastructure and more recently a ton of acquisition activity, buying up uh, other assessment companies and entering into the full life cycle of learning through practice test material, continual education delivery, and more the, the lifeblood that was the high stakes testing world that I lived and breathed for the last uh, 18 years. Uh, why am I interested? Uh, Traditional high stakes testing has been done and delivered in testing locations or in high volume environments, specifically in schools like with the ACT where it's been done on paper and pencil. Uh, obviously, in the last five to seven years, we've seen a shift from a more traditional model where people come to take exams in high stakes testing locations to a more uh, remote uh, assessment environment where people are sitting as we are today in front of a computer typically it being locked down and taking an exam so I think my interest here is the impact of now everybody doing this uh, from a learning and assessment perspective is how the uptake and change in trends from a high stakes traditional model going to a testing location to a more remote and secure assessment experience uh, in the homes. We used to call it kitchen testing. Uh, now, mm -hmm. as you can imagine, everybody's sitting in any location in their home, uh, trying to get some peace and quiet, either working or studying or, uh, or yeah, <laughs> enjoying other things. So that, that's really my interest to not so much from the learning aspect, but really the impact, the downstream impact on assessment as it relates to this new model. Mm -hmm. Yes. Nice Thank to meet you. you. 
and welcome again. Thank you. Would you like to go next, Michael? Just unmute yourself. Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Michael Allendi. Uh, I'm Learning Design Innovation Manager at Florida International University in, at the time, sunny Miami. Uh, there's a tropical storm brewing in the ocean, so we'll see how long that lasts. Um, I, my academic backgrounds in cultural anthropology, neuroscience, and business. Uh, I was one of those people who got a varied amount of degrees in, in different things, but the reason why online learning and especially remote learning and engagement are important to me uh, is because the work that I am in uh, primarily works with underserved communities throughout Latin American communities in the Caribbean and of course here in the United States and I believe that remote learning is the best opportunity to give access right to the most people across continents throughout different socioeconomic statuses uh, and so, you know, we all know that access is, is, is a, an option, it's a possibility, um, but doing it well and doing it with that human component uh, is where engagement is just that much more um, necessary for effective learning and effective connection to occur. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Cindy hasn't been able to join us yet, so we will... Uh, we will ask Nick to introduce himself. Hi, um, I'm Nick Peachy and I'm based in the UK. Um, I come at this, uh, my job role now is a pedagogical director of Peachy Publications, which is a digital publishing company. And my background is, is actually in classroom teaching. I was, I've been involved in classroom teaching for about 30 years now and sort of got it interested in um, teacher training and, and teaching online um, in at the end of the last century, which makes me sound very old. You know, I've taught my first <laughs> online class in 1998. Um, so, you know, this is 22 years on for me now. Um, uh, I, I came through sort of um, training teachers to use technology into sort of product development and project management, mainly um, products for teachers to help teachers use technology. Um, I've been involved in blogging and, and um, online course development as well, developing courses for companies like the British Council and Eton College. And um, more recently, I started my own company and my interest really is, is in, has been in developing materials that are, uh, deliver effectively in this kind of remote environment, uh, teaching environment. You know, there's lots of textbooks and course books that publishers are trying to make digital in some way to sort of deliver in this environment. And for me, I think they've kind of got it wrong. And uh, hopefully the materials that I'm producing have got it right. And uh, they've been specifically designed to work in the environment and to be engaging and, uh, and to, to sort of function within the kind of the digital framework that you have within a remote classroom like Zoom. Thanks, Nick. And some of the some of the work you are doing on making these digital artifacts interesting and exciting to learners, um, is it is it possible to see it on your website? Would you be able to chat in your your address? Um, yeah, I can share an address and, and people can yeah, see that. We'll that. Uh, and some examples as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Karthik, would you like to go next? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Karthik. Uh, I run a company called Let's Play to Learn over the last three years. Uh, I've been passionate about learning and knowledge management uh, ever since I started my career in the mid 90s. Uh, although I have not played formal uh, uh, roles in academy or uh, learning and development, I've always been a business champion of uh, learning, partnering with uh, L&D teams in the organizations. Uh, I got to work with two large organizations in IT, which is Infosys and Cognizant, which is where I spent close to 20 plus years. And in both these organizations, uh, I've always been in touch with the latest uh, things uh, in terms of how do you make learning engaging, uh, be it social forums, peer learning, gamified learning. In fact, uh, over the last uh, decade or so is where I really started doing some informal experiments originally in the field of uh, game-based learning which took me into a completely different uh, career and path, which has become my company now. So I've been into game-based space for the uh, last 10 years. 
and uh, obviously uh, there is so much to know and learn uh, given that you are into learning uh, there is so much that you don't know uh, so many exciting things uh, learning is a uh, learning and teaching how to uh, uh, appreciate uh, the sorry learning how to teach is a ongoing process right understanding learner engagement is a ongoing uh, thing absolutely that's i mean that's a that's a fascinating background again an engineer working in large it organizations and now you know doing game based and gamified learning uh, have you seen that organizations are a bit more open to games in learning than they were a few years back yes yes to some extent but i would still say that it depends on the uh, the person whom we are talking to definitely the millennials are certainly bought in uh, to the to, to the new approach sure. but uh, th there is this shift that needs to occur and it's very quickly happening it, it's it's happening as we talk in the last 5 years i would say probably 10 years back th there are still people who find uh, play or game as an opposite of work they they take it as uh, opposites Uh, right. I believe, and we all should believe that they can coexist. That's the whole purpose of uh, our initiative. Absolutely, L true learning is a form of play, right? It puts you in a zone. Exactly. Uh, thank, exactly. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, how about you, Nikita? What's uh, what's your background? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nikita Dang, and I'm based out of New York. I have over eight years of experience in the tech industry. uh currently i'm working as an avp of product for uh, magic attack and here i'm leading their b2b learning experience platform called as magic box where we leverage digital technology to bring remote learning to life uh with the product experience uh, during the pandemic we've seen what digital adoption is going in the market and we also find to do a survey in that right with the accessible So, uh, I just share like my experience working with all like the uh, like the companies, publishers, and so many of the leading authors. Last close to the effect of the revolution. Nikita, th thanks for introducing yourself. We we think your voice was a little choppy, so when your connection gets a little better, I'll bring you back in for for some of those comments. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. So let's dive right into this. Um, pick your top 3 reasons this is for you now what why is learning learner engagement so important to you here's a here's a poll that rohan is running for us um, just just pick your top 3 reasons it's just one question yes i've just launched the poll and we've started to get in responses Thank you, Rohan. And I'm real curious to see this because all of them sound so good, but we have to make a choice. What are the top three for you? Great. We give it another thirty seconds. Sure. Very interesting. Yes, I can. I can kind of see the results and the kind of. Do you want to display the results? Yes, I'll just do it right away. We have one engaged group here. We've got a very good percentage of voting on this poll. Okay, so the winner is enhances the learner's ability to absorb. That's sixty-five percent, and. close behind is makes learning more fun uh 62% and produces better learning outcomes 62% so those those were the three thank you thank you very much i'd be interested to see what how my children rate on that particular scale <laughs> right so we are getting the teacher's perspective here right but i was i was hoping or maybe not hoping but i was wondering if they might say makes teaching easier but that's not what came out as the top reason it makes it easier to absorb learning so i appreciate that 
Let's uh, then think about the stages in which you accomplish this. But before that, some research. Um, when um, learnupon.com polled managers of online training, now we are talking about workplace learning here, they found engagement of learners to be the top challenge. Everything else was way behind. Another survey, this time in the education space, this is e4e.org, nearly 68% of teachers feel that students are less engaged during remote instruction than before the pandemic. And that engagement declined even further over the course of the semester. So this is a very recent finding again. And so it goes without saying that you should have no difficulty justifying to yourself how to learn engaging learners and also justifying to yourself any investments you might need to make to make engagement better. Because this is, this is a crying need now. What are the stages of engagement? Many people think of engagement in classroom terms, right? How do you make a great beginning? How do you grab attention? How do you get them all animated and excited? How to do an icebreaker? How to give breakout sessions? But that's a myopic view. I think the broader view is that is the pre class engagement, which means even before you, the class begins, you start engaging them. I worked a lot with West Coast University. They do a lot of you know, training for clinical assistants and nurses and paramedics and all kinds of health workers other than doctors, of course. And they do a lot of leadership training as well. One of the things they did with their online learning was they used to send a teaser and the teaser would be something which would have a little, a little something that would build anticipation for the class. And this takes some creativity, but almost think advertising. You know, what would you do? Uh, something like we're gonna play a fun game or we're gonna, don't miss the beginning. We're gonna have a fun, whatever, trivia or something like that. Here's another example, post a virtual class prep, which means just before the class, Put a little prep thing. Now here, here's an example of that, a happy meter. I mean, it's, it's very simple. There's, there's no big deal about it, but just one or two questions that are sufficiently confusing. Uh, for example, your child is really upset and best friend is moving out of the city and is constantly crying. How do you deal with it? And then you give, you know, one, two, three. And the happy meter, which is on my left over here, shows how you did. So the moment you do these three or four questions, nothing more than that, nothing that takes more than three minutes, the happy meter needs to be happy, which means you are ready for the class, right? So just a simple engagement tool. You could use some of this. Then you come to class. Now you have in-class engagement, and that's all about icebreakers, learning games, engagers, energizers, you know, there are all kinds of activities and there's plenty of research on this. And if you look at some of the open source as well as commercially uh, available tools, you'll get a huge menu of games to choose from and also non-game activities. So, um, so I'll leave it at that. And then comes post-class engagement because between one class and the other, you want them to come back, not to the class, but you want them to come back to learning. You know? So a very simple example would be a flashcard. And the idea of a flashcard would be to just help them revise what they learned in the class or you know, take a little brain teaser over here. Um, this will take me some time to solve, so I'll not attempt it. But basically, uh, a little brain teaser over here. Doing these kinds of things, or even polls, surveys, and quizzes. I think a survey is a great tool. So let's say you're teaching a class for management students on um, basic strategies. And you're quite indifferent if you wanna go with cost first or differentiation first. You could, you could just do a simple survey. Hey, uh, what you would like me to start with? Would you like me to start with? cost or differentiation in the next class. And that builds a little bit of anticipation between classes. So I'll go back to our 
um, thought of choosing these engagement activities. I think the framework uh, that I use a lot is, is this the time to use a game activity or a non-game activity? And, and, the, and the choice would depend on the learner's age, uh, where, at what point are you in the classroom, and uh, the subject matter, and whether, whether you're trying to foster some kind of a competition, because a lot of games are competitive. So those factors would decide whether you want to use game activities or non-game activities or mix them in any way. Similarly, competitive and collaborative activities. Sometimes you want competition because you want to build individual cognition, but sometimes you want them to collaborate because a lot of learning happens by just being a part of something happening, right? It's, it's a kind of a mini apprenticeship. So there's a lot of peer learning. There's a lot of peer tutoring. And many times learners learn a lot better from others who are just a little ahead of them than from the teacher. So how do you accomplish that? You do that through table exercises or little parts where you bring them together and so on. And we'll give you some examples of that. The third uh, framework you want to use is, do you want group activities or do you want some self-learning? Now, it's a big misconception that if everybody's in the class, we must be doing everything in group. No, people need a break. You know, they just need to go on and spend maybe a couple of minutes, do something and come back. So you could even give self-learning activities in class and you could give group activities after class, counterintuitive as may sound. And lastly, who wants the control? Do you want the control with the learner or do you want to keep the control? That completely has to do with your assumption about how self-directed your learner is. If you, if you trust your learner to do a good job, then you want them to give the, have the control. But if, if you think they're sort of easily distracted, they're not gonna to stick to the curriculum, then you better have the control. So these are the different things you would, different factors you would think of um, to determine which engagement strategies you wanna use. So with, with that, I'll give you some examples. Let's say you have a very small class, okay? Just a, um, maybe a handful, let's say six or eight learners, that's it. And you want a competitive activity. You could do something like this. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward example of a, a relay wheel. Um, and I hope you can see my video here where each team has a name and the wheel goes around and stops at Panthers. And so Panthers get a question and then it goes around again and then, and then cold calls the next group, which is uh, warriors and there's a question for warriors. And then you have a little board over there saying who scored how much. So uh, something like this could be good for a small class. If you have young learners, learners that lose attention quickly, you might think of having more games and videos and quizzes. If you wanted to break the monotony, if you get tired of your own voice, then give them a solo game, you know, let them, let them go and play it. So here, here's an example of a solo game, mountain climb. Very simple again, you have a mountain to summit and you have questions. If you answer them correctly, you start moving up and scale up. And if you get the next question, you attempt it, don't get it right, you stay right there wait for the next question. This lets the learner go at their own speed uh, before they get back into the synchronous experience of the classroom. A lot of the times, if you're in a professional training setting, people learn a lot from each other. So you need to give them social channels. I remember I attended a course recently at uh, Harvard Business School and there was 1,500 CEOs learning crisis management, 1500. And the chat over on my right was moving faster than I could read because people were exchanging business cards, people were writing to each other about their experiences. And there was so much learning in the chat 
in addition to what the professor was teaching us. And, and everybody saved the chat log and looked at it. So you want to give them chat channels and you want to leverage those. Journaling is excellent when you want adult learners to reflect. And if you wanted to have small group collaboration, you could use Zoom breakout or other kind of breakout meetings. So these are just some examples I wanted to share with you. And, uh, and then I want to go back to our panel and, and learn from them what are some of the best practices they have seen in the area of uh, learner engagement. So um, I am also a faculty fellow here at FIU. I teach courses in our, our honors college. Uh, and one strategy I've been using uh, to, to kind of ensure that I'm, I'm connecting the learning with what um, the learners desire are looking for, right? We know that one of the, the primary distinctions between andragogy and pedagogy, how we, how adults learn and how, how children, students learn, mm -hmm. um, is that adults say, hey, bring what is relevant to my life. Allow me to bring that into the learning experience. And so I've tried a strategy with my upper, cl uh, my upper classmen students, uh, juniors and seniors, where I allow them to create the rubric for their mm -hmm. final project. And that does two things for engagement. One, they've now put a personal token towards the end product saying, this is what I want to earn and this is what I think will be high quality. Mm -hmm. And two, it forces me and a group of them to have a synchronous uh, discussion over how self-assessment will work best for them. I think far too frequently, we think that remote learning needs to happen completely asynchronously. And, and that's just not true. So the two best strategies, I think, uh, for deploying effective remote learning and getting engagement uh, increased there is doing something where there's more buy-in. We call it contract grading, um, mm -hmm. where they create right, the, the agreement of what their, their grade will look like, uh, and then incorporating intentional synchronous components. Thank you, Mike. That's, that's very interesting. Getting them in on the rubrics um, and then introducing the synchronous component as well. Um, did you want to add something, Nikita? Uh, Nikita or? Sure. Uh, my, is my audio uh, good yes. now? It's fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. So um, what we have seen is like a collaboration, making learning fun and continuous feedback loop is, to, is key to drive the engagement in remote learning. So family teacher communication is the foundation to support like student learning. So, um, and it's more essential uh, than ever in this distance learning uh, era, right? Parents role has evolved um, as uh, they're actively participating in their kids learning journey. And sure. uh, basically the parent teacher communication channel and keeping them in sync with how their kids are performing is uh, important. And uh, the other aspect is with respect to the uh, social emotional learning inquiry based uh, project based learning uh, is that is widely implemented in the classroom now that we're seeing uh, as a trend and uh, where students can explore like the quizzes, uh, get answers to that and also practice their 21st century skills like uh, teamwork, problem solving, research gathering, and synthesizing while self-directing their own learning. So uh, some of that, and of course, like, you know, um, tools like where teachers could have breakout sessions, uh, the, uh, the teams could kind of have group discussions and collaboratively work with each other, uh, okay. have multi-play multi simulations, interactive workbooks, and activities is what we're seeing as being widely used now. Excellent. Thank you. And that's, that's interesting. I mean, we missed some of your initial introduction, but you, you are part of an ed tech company that brings together, a, it's almost a platform for teachers, learners, that is students and their parents, right? And this, Correct. these three players have a stake in the outcome. Correct. Yeah. So we are seeing like an integrated system is a need, right? Where you could impart like the education track, like the feedback loop and sure. also involves like the parents in that journey. Sure, thanks. I wanna keep going just a little bit and uh, let you uh, weigh in uh, Nick and Kartik as well. Um, just give me one minute to go a little further with this. 
um, which is our, our third piece, the digital tools for remote learner engagement. Um, and here's a typology of those virtual classroom activities, you know, basically activities that you can do inside a virtual classroom on Zoom or Teams or WebEx or whatever that is you're using. Learning games, um, quizzes and assessments, video activities. Video is big now. A lot of the learning is in the form of short videos, but then videos need not be sort of lean back and watch videos. They could be edge of the seat videos where you interact with the videos. Um, virtual learning buddies, so these are like chatbots, and nudge learning, which means that you have control. Um, the teacher has control, and to the extent that you nudge the learner from time to time to experience short bursts of learning in between classrooms. So typically you would have a model of some kind of a forgetting curve and you would send or schedule to send nudges to your learner. So th that's kind of a, a broad classification. Uh, and I, here's, a, here's a number of tools that, that accomplish some of these uh, engagements. Um, so now I want to come back to you again and ask you uh, also your thoughts on what are some of your favorite tools? And more importantly, uh, what are the new skills an instructor needs to learn? What should I do so that I do not become obsolete in this remote teaching, remote learning world? What are some of the competencies I need to gain? Uh, how can I remain relevant and thrive in this new world? Maybe, uh, maybe I could request Nick to go first. Sure. Um, I, th I mean, I think uh, particularly in the remote classroom, I think teachers have to be able to make the adjustment to, to develop and, and um, enable students into personal skills in this kind of environment. You know, and I think that that's really important. You know, I think why a lot of lessons have, have uh, and a lot of teachers have struggled is, you know, this in, in, inability to engage with the learner through their webcam. You know, um, I, I worked for a couple of years with uh, teachers um, who were teaching students in Brazil, and we found when teachers first started teaching their students, they'd have the webcam sort of over here, it would be looking at the side of their head, or it would be down here looking at their, up their nose. And they, they, they kind of didn't have any awareness of how that looked to students, you know, and how that they can use this thing as a tool, you know, and for me that that's one of the really important things is that you're able to develop, you know, a relationship with someone through this camera and sort of use your, your body language as I'm kind of trying to do now and use proximity with the camera as well to sort of come in and, and actually use that as a tool for building your relationship with your students, you know. I, th I think that's really, really important and something that we need to share with students as well, because, you know, our students, when, when they join the workplace, are going to need to be able to sort of, you know, communicate well in this kind of environment. And I think, you know, teaching those skills is very important and, and that can keep students engaged too. So thinking about how you use this camera is really important, I think, as a, as a, as a tool within this environment. That's, that's such an important point, Nick. Um, I, I mean, we, we just talked about this briefly earlier, but you, you're standing as you're talking to us and we are able to see your entire body language. And that's so important yeah. in a teaching context. I tried to get far enough so I can use my hands and right. you know, it, it, it enables you to work with proximity a bit and sort of come into your computer and say to students, hey, listen to me, you know, or you can move back or, you know, you can, okay, you do this now and I'll step out. Right, right. So, you know, you can use that space as you would the classroom, you know, and teachers, you know, most of the teachers when they go straight online are straight into the sort of seated head and shoulders position. And, you know, we have a nice view of their ceiling and what's on what kind of light lighting they have, but, you know, it, it distorts the, the sort of person and the face and the communication. Yeah, I remember I attended a, a, a webinar um, by General Stan McIntyre and he, um, he said, you need to learn how to throw yourself at the camera. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's the only way you're going to communicate with anybody for the next several weeks. So you, you have to become good at it. 
Um, great. Yeah. I, a, a, anyone else want to be? I was yeah. just going to say, I, I think it definitely increases the engagement. I've, I've seen with my kids where, where a teacher has recorded a video of instruction versus that live instruction experience. It's just mm -hmm. so much different for particularly kids of my age of 10 and 13. They, 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 didn't, they know someone sitting in front of a camera just having recorded it. And so there's no engagement at all. Yeah, so I actually, scenario. I wanted to continue on, on that. I think with video, and I, I have to make a confession, I'm a proud self-proclaimed millennial. And I know that's like a curse word some places, um, but something that you know we've seen with the research, looking at how Gen Z and millennials uh, interact through their social medias and through video, it's authentic communication. So exactly what you just mentioned about a pre-recorded video, right? If you want true engagement, you want true relationship building, record a video or have videos recorded where you make a mistake, right? You, your, your shirt's a little disheveled and you fix that. You, you show a view of your home. Um, we saw the transfer with, with a lot of people off of Facebook, off of Instagram, onto Snapchat. And my generation was like, that's weird. But when we looked a little bit deeper into it, we see that learners want an authentic experience. And so what Snapchat did is it treated a conversation like a real conversation. You say something and then it goes away. Um, and, and a tool that I really would love to mention here, since we're on the topic of videos uh, that I love for engagement, it's very low cost. Uh, well, it, it has low cost and paid options, but it helps add interactivity onto videos is something called PlayPosit. Uh, you can go through a video, add questions, and it's a really great way of keeping someone engaged and also getting some data behind to see was this lecture, was this training effective as it went through. So I have, uh, uh, I just caught on what Michael said about the authenticity, right? Uh, that the uh, learners want. Uh, it's a very interesting point because I'm also getting adjusted to it. Sometimes I try to put a virtual background. Today I was in two minds. Should I put a virtual background of my company with the products, uh, which is one way to do, or uh, actually do? Uh, sometimes it uh, it's nice, uh, it's nice, but the authentic background uh, is what most people seem to be preferring. So you are always at a dilemma, and some people are even saying that it's okay if kids walk in. It gives you a uh, or somebody walks into the room. It gives a human touch to it. But we as instructors or facilitators, we, we want to be that formal official types, let there be no any disturbance, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a big dilemma. But I think the, uh, just to add to what Michael said, the authenticity is preferred. The second aspect uh, is that today, at least in the uh, population that uh, the, the community that uh, where I get to facilitate, it's a very big mindset shift appearing in front of a camera. Uh, it's not just the technology part, just seeing your own face and that of the learner's face on screen, right? And uh, what we have seen is typically I'm talking about students, UG and PG, and uh, not, not the corporate training. Uh, I'm talking about UG, PG. Some of them turn off their video cams. So you don't know whether they are really uh, starved of bandwidth because of which they are keeping their audios on or is the facilitator's uh, communication poor or they just want to listen and be done with it. It's a very, very tricky thing. Actually, there are uh, good reasons for both. People turn off their video because their bandwidth is not sufficient. Also because they don't want, they want to be doing something else. So it, these have to be monitored. That's where we need to find even more better ways of engaging the audience. That's where some of the tools that you explain Vikas come in really handy. Sure. Perfect. There's also a whole list of um, uh, tricks to pretend engagement that I have prepared, but that's beyond the scope of this webinar. Well, I'll, I'll share just one. If somebody just cold calls you, you said, the connection was really choppy for the last 30 seconds. Can you repeat that, please? And you're back in business. All right. I hope my students don't hear you say that. I feel like I'm going to be getting that response. <laughs> All right. Okay, so could we uh, could we keep going? We are almost at the end of it. I'm gonna I'm gonna invite uh, my colleague Sandeep here. Sandeep is in charge of Harbinger's um, interactive tools for e-learning, and uh, I just want you to sort of uh, 
summarize the takeaways and you know get him in to tell us a little bit. Uh, so Sandeep, why don't you uh, why don't you just take us through this? Um, basically, we learned that engagement is critical. It spans the whole life cycle, pre-class, in-class, post-class. You have to carefully plan how to engage learners, including how you engage with the video tools. And finally, pick and master the right digital tools. So tell us a little bit about those tools. Oh yeah, thank you uh, so much, uh, Vikas, and all the panelists for uh, the wonderful discussion. Because uh, I know you all talked about the strategies, different tools to be used, and how it is uh, beneficial, uh, you know, to the teachers as well as to the students. And uh, we could see very interesting comments coming on the chat as well as people asking various questions. So of course, we'll go to that. And uh, before uh, doing that, like uh, some of the tools which are, uh, you know, showcased by uh, Vikas. I'm going to talk very quickly about what all we have uh, you know, as a Harbinger group uh, to offer. So in our uh, uh, bouquet of products, uh, we have a very interesting tool called as Raptivity, and uh, we have two variants of it, wherein uh, you know, uh, this ensures uh, that the online uh, learning becomes very engaging. And then there is a one variant for virtual classroom now everybody is facing the challenge of going online suddenly teachers are facing issues in it and then uh, uh, the issue is again how to ensure the learners engagement and then the activity for virtual classroom uh, using its uh, you know ready to use templates which are customizable makes it very easy for uh, activity 2020 is another version uh, which is uh, focused towards the instructional designers who are actually creating the courses they can integrate it with lms uh, do the SCOM tracking side of it, do the analytics, and then, you know, it takes care of that. Uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, launched a product called as Quillians, which is the uh, world's first AI-powered question generator. And uh, this is great help for teachers because uh, uh, this can save uh, efforts of teachers for creating questions to the tune of about 70-80%. Uh, what they need to do is they just need to, you know, copy and paste text on Quillians platform. And within few clicks, you get uh, ready-made answers, which are of like multiple choice questions, or true or false, uh, WH questions like when, where, what, and uh, certain other type of questions which can be exported and used for uh, creation of quizzes. Uh, along with that, what we have is, you know, we, we were discussing about the effectiveness of video and how video communication is so important. Uh, Michael talked about it. And uh, we have a product called it's Exaltive, which is a personalized interactive video platform. Uh, which really takes care of all your already created videos uh, can be made interactive with uh, Exaltive. So with that, then, you know, they become interactive. People can play with the video. They can do so many things. And then you get very rich engagement analytics out of it. Uh, we have, uh, because nowadays the nudge learning is uh, key and the sending the micro learning nudges to the students is very important because uh, you know, it's very important to fight the forgetting curve. And uh, I saw one of the questions by one of the participants that how fast people are forgetting, or what's the attention span? So you know that the, the forgetting theory says uh, within about six uh, hours of learning, you lose almost 50, 60% of what you learned. And then sending those nudges is very, very critical. And Sprinkle Zone exactly does that, wherein you, know, you can uh, send those personalized nudges and the micro learning nudges, especially to make sure that students are uh, learning and remind, uh, remembering it again and again. And uh, we have, of course, uh, a product called this Pritela. And Pritela is uh, your virtual assistant. So this can be used in variety of ways, wherein uh, uh, you are a university, so you can say, okay, can I link it with my systems and uh, use it as a course recommender? So students are asking questions about their uh, qualifications, what they want to do, and then it can automatically answer. And then this can be used in variety of ways. So uh, that's very quickly about uh, uh, the kind of product bouquet we have in the e-learning space and the learning space uh, especially. And after this, uh, what I want to do now is uh, maybe open the uh, event for uh, questions by attendees. So if you want to ask our uh, esteemed panelists any question, then you can just go ahead and type your question in the Q&A panel, or you can also do it in uh, the chat window. And uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll request uh, the panelists to answer that. Thank you, Sandeep. This is a hallmark of a perfect webinar to finish in 50 seconds and leave 50 minutes and leave 10 minutes for Q&A. So we are, we are on time here. 
Um, <clears throat> curious to learn your questions. There was a question about uh, uh, what's the uh, adult average adult attention span? Does anybody have research on that? I shared uh, some research out of MIT that they collected from participants in their MOOCs. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a huge, a large scale study. Uh, and that had showed that the attention span was between two to six minutes. Um, and wow. I, yeah, uh, not surprised <laughs> again, millennial, but um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the data that we also share with our faculty here. And uh, here's another one. You can see it on chat. How do we handle technology fatigue, both for teachers as well as students? Um, hmm. Is that a I technology think, I think fatigue from a, for students? Go ahead, Ian. I was just going to say yeah, that's been extensively studied in the assessment industry just mm -hmm. because, you know, this traditional standard multiple choice sitting through 150 questions and getting uh, exam fatigue that's been extensively studied obviously with the introduction of more technology and gamification and sim simulations and different question types uh, it just it's all about engagement and and maintaining that engagement uh, so yeah whether it's fatigue or whether it's just uh, keeping them engaged is a different topic I mean, if I could come in here, I think one of the problems that we have, particularly when developing online courses, is that we're continually asking questions of students that we already know the answers to. You know, it's like this kind of constant test, you know, and I think we should be asking questions that we don't know the answers to or that the, the, the answers could be very varied and very personal. For example, you know, uh, students always ask, you know, why is the sky blue? You know, my, my daughter asked that and there's a, there's a logical explanation that you can get. So you can test someone on that and you can get a computer to, uh, uh, you know, feedback on whether they've got that answer right or not. But if you start looking at really interesting questions like, well, what would be a better colour to have the sky? What, what color would you prefer the sky to be? How mm. could we change the color of the sky? How would it affect people if we changed the color of the sky to green or, or orange or purple? You know, asking those sort of questions which, you know, call on our, our students to answer authentically, creatively, and, and from their own, you know, imagination or experience. I think those are the much more engaging questions. You know, we can come back to why it's blue, but, you know, Asking the, the questions that there isn't a fixed answer to and we don't know the answer to, I think becomes much more interesting and much more interesting for students, but much more difficult to evaluate for us as, as you know, course designers, uh, instructional designers. Of course. I'd also like to that add... they can't just... No, I was just going to say questions that Alexa can't answer. <laughs> yeah, you can't compete with Google, so why do you, why even try? Uh, I'd like to add something for the technology fatigue that will help. And we all know it because we're sitting on Zoom for like eight hours a day, mm -hmm. is make sure that the required online interactions are succinct, right? Because if I'm spending time here and you're just doing something that an answer I could have found on Alexa, now I'm not even finding a purpose behind this online interaction. I'm mm -hmm. literally just wasting my time and I'm tuned out. Uh, what I try to do in my course is I actually try to enable uh, learning to happen with their mobile devices so they can then get up, go and do something, right? See a, an advertisement outside, uh, look for a design opportunity to make something better um, where they can then take their learning experience away from the screen um, and, and bring it on with their phone. Michael, there's a question for you from John Robertson. Um, if you can see that, you can answer it. Um, can you share a starting point for AR technology? Are there entry level tools for developing AR? Yeah, I, I just shared a tool in there called Zapper mm -hmm. AR. Their education uh, um, branches or their education pricing is really affordable. It's fairly intuitive. Uh, let's be honest, anytime someone mentions augmented reality or virtual mm -hmm. reality, I don't know if any of you react like I do. And I'm like, is that a real thing now? Like, is, are we there? Um, so it, it does take some work. There's some other tools 
right? Sketchfab, um, ThingLink, uh, there, there, there are quite a, a few tools, but if you reach out, I, I can send you a presentation that I have with some, some other resources that, that are, that are, that we can do, that anyone can do. We won't need an, an expert. One question in chat was, uh, how do we bring experiential hands-on training? Uh, are there any tools and games that can help in this area? Uh, can, can you elaborate uh, the person uh, who asked this question, experiential and hands-on learning in uh, what context or domain, if you can elaborate? I, I do understand the overall field, but, uh, yeah just to get the context better yeah just just knowing the person who is asking i think this has to do with uh, essentially uh, uh, engineering setup right where you need to uh, where you need to work with things right okay 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 so uh, in the case in the field of management there are enough simulations available uh, in the case of engineering, I'm not aware of too many. I'm sure they exist, but not as many because management as a field has more. Uh, probably some hands-on experiments, uh, as in like, uh, I mean, there, there's nothing like, uh, let me take the case of mechanical engineering, right? The best way to learn automobile engineering is actually fix a tire, remove the tire, put the spare part. I mean, give, give, that is really experiential learning. Right? I mean, you, you go to a mechanic shop, observe him or her doing, and you do the same thing. Uh, I mean, you don't, it doesn't have to be the computer-based simulation, etc. There, there are a lot more things possible. Similarly, in the case of electrical engineering, do some small chores that usually the, that get outsourced to your electrician or your plumber. Okay. At least the simple ones. That is experiential learning. Okay. So that's, uh, there's another question. I have a, hi, Michael. I have a key stakeholder for our apprenticeship program that vehemently declines e-learning for that training. He believes electricians only learn from live instructor-led offerings. You know, in, in higher ed, I, I deal with that conversation far more frequently than I should, and, and, and it's heartbreaking. Um, I can just share maybe like three strategies that I've done that have helped ease it. There are some individuals that they need to be forced to by their managers to even make the decision. But I'll say there are a few things that help. So I, I teach a course uh, at FIU actually called The Power of Play. I know uh, some of you might, might appreciate that. And one thing I've learned when you're talking to educators, right, all these PhDs about uh, in, having play or gamification components in their course, you might wanna change your terminology. Instead of saying fun or game or gamification, I just use effective engagement. Right, this is going to make your content your content more engaging. Uh, the second strategy I use, and, and we deployed this in a, our College of Nursing, and as you can imagine, that's one particular field where hands-on is very important. We leveraged videos. We had students engage with people in their home, right, and they did videos modeling behavior. So first, they would the fact the uh, subject matter expert would record themselves. Then we would have students watch that video, then students do the action recording themselves, and then a review. Um, we even put a, a intermediate component there where students were reviewing the videos in groups before they submitted their final video to the faculty. And the way I kind of angled that conversation to get the faculty on board was, hey, you are an expert on this. Let's collect some video of you doing amazing things that you could share with your colleagues even outside of the course. Um, and then, you know, the third component is identify the WIFM. Wait, I'm sorry, my MBA is always going to sneak in whenever I'm speaking. Uh, what's in it for them? Find out what they need. Find out what they're interested in. Maybe it's getting more exposure. Maybe it's getting more students to enroll. Uh, maybe it's getting more popularity for their program. Uh, and so find a way to tie that in with e-learning since that online realm opens up so many more access points for uh, their particular interest. It's interesting that you said that uh, online is an opportunity uh, from the point of view of giving access to the underprivileged and so on. But here's a question um, from a participant. Any comments on how inclusive would these strategies be when the learner base are persons with disability? That's another type of inclusivity when it's true. 
think about, right? And I think we have dealt with this uh, over a period now. I mean, you have, you know, section 508 compliance for, you know, the learning content and clearly the learning experience is a bit different. But uh, the best you can do is make sure that the learner does not miss out because of disability, at least in terms of the content and curriculum. The experience may be different uh, depending on the ability to experience. Um, and and there so might be clever strategies to make it better. I'm sorry. Absolutely, because and, uh, we've been seeing a lot of uh, traction on the accessibility norms. Uh, from a lot of tech companies and uh, publishers basically to make uh, the content of the CAG 2.0 compliant so that, you know, uh, it complies to all the um, uh, groups. And then uh, with respect to platform as well, like you want means to navigate easily and reach the content and function and also capture all the learning that uh, you do uh, on the platform. So that, that this is something we've been hearing a lot. Yeah. Great. Well, we are almost on the top of the hour here. Um, so I'm gonna hand this back to Rohan. And uh, if panelists, please, please type in your email address in the chat because I'm sure audience wants to talk to you and keep in touch or you know, give you a website or as appropriate. And uh, from, from me personally, thank you to all of you. Over to you, Rohan. Thank you so much, Vikas, and thank you to all our panelists for such a wonderful discussion. In fact, uh, really great thoughts, really good insights, and I'm sure all of our audiences and all of us are going to go back with some amazing food for thought today. And uh, again, uh, thank you so much. And in the meanwhile, if anyone from our audience would have more questions and would like to reach out to Anyone from a panelist or from Harbinger, please feel free to drop a line at products at harbingergroup.com and we'll, we'll be right there with you within no time. Thank you so much. And uh, again, once, uh, once again, thank you and wishing you all the best of health and stay safe. Bye everyone, stay healthy. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye now.